Um, so welcome everybody to this scholarly intersections grant talk. Um, this talk is being hosted by the history department, that's us, um, the Center for the History of Video Games, Technology, and Critical Play, that's also us, um, the American Studies Department, um, and American Indian Studies Department um, for, for this talk, and we appreciate all of their support for this, um, as well as the support of the College of Liberal Arts for making these kinds of talks possible. I am. Um, I'm uh, Professor Sean Smith uh, from the History Department, um, and today we are very, very excited um, and proud to host uh, Maddie Myers, who is an electric pop, uh, electro pop musician, pop culture critic, and writer who has worked at Paste Magazine, Kotaku, The Mary Sue. Um, and is currently the deputy editor for games at Polygon. She is also a podcast host on the Triple Click podcast about games and culture. Uh, that podcast is on the Maximum Fun Network, and she is the co-host of the Mutant Agent Agent. Uh, sorry, the Mutant Ages podcast. I knew I was going to screw that up. Um, <clears throat> that uh, deconstructs X Men comics for their queer subtexts. Uh, welcome, Maddie. It's really fantastic to have you here with us. Thank you for having me. And thank you to everybody who's tuning into the Zoom. I am in Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm here in my office. So you get to join me here. I made a PowerPoint deck for this presentation because I just thought it would be a little more fun that way. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. So you don't have to stare at me the whole time. Can you all see that? Sweet. Okay. So I called this only the stubborn survive because it's how I feel about journalism in general, but especially games journalism, which is what we're going to talk about today. I guess it could also be called how to fix games journalism again, because a lot of people have tried to fix games journalism, uh, including me. It's, it's debatable as to whether I've succeeded. So I'm Maddie Myers. I've been working as a games journalist since 2007, which is when I published my first ever video game review at the Boston Phoenix. Uh, it was for Pokemon Battle Revolution, a game no one remembers. I'm going to open up the chat so I can see it. Okay, great. Please put poggers in there, pog champs in the chat. Uh, in 2011, to show you a picture of me from 2011. I was 25 here. This is an award that I won for an article I wrote about sexism in video game culture at the time. This was also the year that I got my first death threats for writing a story about sexism. Not the same story. By the time I won this award, I was kind of like, I guess this is going to happen if I want to write about sexism in video game culture. Uh, and I kept on doing that and working for the Phoenix full-time until it went out of business in 2013. And for a couple of years after that, I freelanced. I wrote for MIT Press, Paste Magazine, some other places. And I lost a lot of hope in that time because I didn't have a full-time job and freelancing was really hard. And I didn't know how to do it and keep making a living. And something else I did during that time was play every single Metroid video game. Great thing to do when you're depressed, I would say. And this is a page from the Metroid manga, which is uh, written by Koji Tozawa and illustrated by Kenji Ishikawa. And uh, this is this is Samus Aran. She's an intergalactic bounty hunter, kind of like a freelancer. And I related to her a lot during this time period because um, as one of the few women in my field, I felt very little sense of community in that time period because there weren't very many women and there also weren't very many marginalized people who worked in games journalism or who were making games. And what little solidarity there was in that group of people got really shaken after Gamergate in 2014, which I'll get into a little later. And uh, I got scrutinized a lot for my work and uh, sexist insults were regularly levied at me in this time and I was not out as a queer person on the internet or in my writing career until 2015 although I did come out to my friends at age 12. Uh, so skipping ahead I did eventually get another full-time writing job for the Mary Sue 
in 2015. And then I worked at Kotaku from 2018 to 2020. And uh, that was the first time I worked for a mainstream video games only publication was Kotaku. And now I work at Polygon. And my job at Polygon, deputy editor of games, means I direct editorial coverage of games across the site. So that's a very <laughs> long way of saying that since 2007, when I was a little baby, I have become a master <laughs> of video games at a major website. And uh, I got there to, because of my stubbornness. I also had a lot of luck on my side and maybe a little teeny bit of talent, but mostly I was really stubborn. And I see that as a pretty big problem that I had to be, especially as a minority in the industry I'm in. And it probably would have made sense to give up. <laughs> Plenty of people did give up, but I didn't. Why didn't I give up? Well, I had a lot of hope <laughs> as a young kid about video games. I really loved writing and I wanted to be a novelist or a reporter. And then I also had luck. I talked about luck. My biggest point of luck in my life or privilege, although people kind of chafe at that word. So luck is like a way to trick them into accepting it or good fortune. Um, my, my biggest point of luck is uh, that my dad worked at Boston University. So I went there for free, which meant that I didn't have any student loans. So when I graduated, I started working at the Phoenix right away and had a very low paying job there. Uh, but I could afford to do that because I didn't have any loans. And uh, the reason why I really wanted to get into games journalism in particular, I wrote about a lot of other things at the Phoenix, but really honed in on games over time. And now I pretty much just do games uh, is because when I was growing up, I read about games and I just thought I could do better than a lot of the game reviews I was reading. I was uh, young and very confident in my own skills, I suppose. But I also think that back then, a lot of games journalism wasn't the way it was today. It, there was a lot of enthusiast press outlets. Uh, games were products, tech products, pieces of software. Did they work or not? That was the main question, as opposed to what were they saying? What were they showing people? How were they making people feel? So this is the next question I get all the time. How did I get into games journalism? What exactly did I do to make it happen? I did something that I don't think anyone should do, and I can't believe it worked, but I'll tell you what it was anyway. So I'm a millennial. I'm 36. Uh, so I have boomer parents. And uh, I wanted a writing internship uh, in college. And I got an internship at a children's magazine that no longer exists. It was totally useless, didn't teach me any skills at all. They didn't actually let me write any articles. Uh, and then after that, I was like, I got to get a real internship. So my parents, my boomer parents gave me some classic boomer advice, which is why don't you just show up and ask for a job? So I did that. I went to the improper Bostonian offices and they would not see me. And I went to the Boston Magazine offices and they also would not see me. And then I went to the Boston Phoenix, which was a smaller, dingier office. And like the previous two publications, they were completely baffled that I had shown up there. I guess I should also note that I had applied for an internship and been ignored, which is a classic. I'm sure it's happened to many listeners applying for jobs and internships and never hearing back. Uh, so I just showed up and uh, I, I talked to the woman at the front desk at the Phoenix and I said I wanted an informational interview, which is what my parents had told me to say. It's what you ask for when you didn't get a job and you want more information about the company. I don't think any company actually provides this and uh, neither did the Phoenix. And they told me that. And I said, well, I'll just wait until somebody can talk to me. And I just sat there reading a PSN magazine until eventually some guy walked out who wasn't much older than I was, uh, an entry level guy. And he said he'd look at my resume and he worked for one of the executive editors as an editorial assistant. And he, I guess he liked my resume because he passed it on to somebody else. And then those people got in touch. I sent some unsolicited articles to them. And I think all that was enough for them to be like, I guess we'll give her an unpaid internship. Again, not very exciting, but 
it's how I got my foot in the door there because once I was there, I was constantly hanging around reporters and editors and listening to other people who were way more experienced than I was uh, pitching stories. And I got a lot better at doing that. And then eventually I got actually for real hired there and I worked there until it went out of business in 2013. So very beginning of my presentation, I said, why is games journalism so hard and why does it, why does it suck so bad, basically? Uh, so writing for a living doesn't suck. I love doing it. But journalism as an industry, it's in really big trouble. So the Phoenix went out of business for a few reasons. Uh, one of them is just part of the decline of media across every sector. Uh, the Phoenix relied on some ad revenue, but mostly classifieds. So those of you who don't know what classifieds are, Craigslist is basically class free classifieds. It's a free classified section that by existing made it irrelevant and redundant for newspapers to have classified sections. It used to be that you had to pay to put up an ad saying, hey, I've got a guitar I'm trying to give away. Uh, but that's changed. Obviously, you can do all of that on the internet for free with Facebook Marketplace now and all kinds of other Craigslist knockoffs. And that put the Phoenix out of business. Uh, we had a huge amount of classified income that all went away. There was some advertising income, but mainly it was the classifieds going away that destroyed it. And that has happened to tons and tons of newspapers across the country and elsewhere, not just in the United States. Uh, and online publications, they tend to use ad revenue. Obviously, they're not using classifieds anymore, but advertising revenue is really different on the internet than it ever was for print. Uh, rates are much worse. Generally, uh, people don't really look at online ads. <laughs> they block them. I'm sure all of you do, and I can't blame you. Uh, so all this to say, uh, media outlets don't have money. So there aren't enough jobs to go around. There aren't mentorship opportunities that there were 10, 20 years ago. And even back then, there were not very many. And there are no signs of that changing anytime soon. And in video games, I would say it's even worse because a lot of mainstream publications still don't have video game sections. Uh, but I'll get into that later on, the, the specific problems with video games. So my journalism baggage. As I said, I was working for a mainstream publication. And that background, I think, has given me a very different focus in terms of how I think about games and talk about games because I didn't come up writing for IGN or Nintendo Power or PSN Magazine, even though I was reading it in the lobby that day. I came up in a sort of old school newsroom atmosphere. And that newsroom wasn't writing for the Associated Press or NPR. It wasn't forcing me to be neutral or objective. It was an atmosphere that was really into gonzo journalism and memoir style reporting and actual legal reporting skills were really important, but the idea that you could be objective wasn't really on the table. Subjectivity was always a big part of how the Phoenix operated. It was a very left-leaning paper. It was also built on a hierarchy of editors that is pretty classic. I came up understanding the typical relationship between an editor-in-chief, a managing editor, a series of editors underneath them that cover different sections. And uh, that is not necessarily something that folks who came up working for really small blogs, that's not an experience they have, which is fine. I'll get to blogs in a moment and how important they were. But because I was one of the people who was coming from a much more traditional journalism background, I had experience with being edited in a way that many other games writers don't because so many newspapers were closing and because so few formal newspapers, mainstream formal newspapers were covering games. Uh, it just means that I regularly meet folks who are games journalists who aren't even used to having an edit at all, let alone being edited multiple times, having fact checkers and so on and so forth. So I had this very rigorous training. And again, this was luck. I, the executive editor who got past my resume that day had a son who was really into video games. And so he said to everyone at the paper, we're going to cover video games and we're going to. Unmute.
unmute. Here we go. All right. So the Phoenix decided to put video games in the arts section as opposed to some other technology section, for example. Uh, video games were alongside dance reviews, art museum reviews, music reviews, movie reviews. They were seen as being on that same level. And also, the other important piece of this is that the Boston Phoenix was a local newspaper. These are the main kinds of, of newspapers that are gone now, especially post-COVID. Uh, but it meant that I was covering as a, not just a critic covering games for the art section, I was also reporting on local stories. So Harmonics, based in Boston, Irrational Games of Bioshock Infinite fame, closed in 2014, the year after the Phoenix closed. I was always really sad. I didn't get to cover that for the Phoenix. Uh, I covered indie game studios, like Firehose Games was founded by some MIT students, and that's in Boston. The list goes on. I was covering games in a local way, the way that you would cover like an underground punk show. But my equivalent of that was knowing Zoe Quinn way before Depression Quest came out and sparked Gamergate and all of that. That was just a twine game that was getting shared in dark bars with other game games developers. And I would just go to meetups and meet people that way. And that's all stuff the Phoenix taught me how to do. So let's talk about blogs, shall we? This is another thing about the time that I came up that I feel almost lucky about because blogs aren't really a thing anymore. <laughs> uh, but in the 2010s, they were so totally a thing. Uh, so I'm, I'm highlighting the Brainy Gamer here. This was Michael Abbott's blog. And uh, there were many really cool blogs that kind of surrounded the Brainy Gamer in this time and referred to themselves as the Brainy Sphere. So one of them was Lee Alexander's blog. Hers was titled Sexy Video Game Land. Uh, she's, of course, uh, became a famous critic and journalist after that, and now she works on video games. Uh, another one, another person in that sphere was Kieran Gillen, who people probably know now for writing X-Men comics, but back then he was writing about video games. He wrote a manifesto called The New Games Journalism in 2004. There was this other guy, Chris Dolan, who also went on to write video games. Uh, he wrote Mark of the Ninja, if people remember that one. Um, he also founded Kill Screen Magazine, which was a little tiny indie magazine at that time. And uh, another Brainy Sphere guy was Mitch Kripata, who wrote for the Boston Phoenix with me. And he had his own blog, Insult Sword Fighting. And all those people were, they were Gen X. They were older than me. So these were people who I was growing up reading. When I was 22, they were in their 30s and the more experienced folks, but writing about games in the Brainy Gamer style, that sort of memoir style, that wasn't happening in mainstream publications and it wasn't happening at places like IGN or Kotaku really either, but it started to happen because of those blogs. And I also really tried to introduce that type of writing to the Phoenix when it existed, because I thought that having that more quote unquote, subjective memoir style would be what would really matter when it came to covering games and seeing them as, as art, as well as pop culture artifacts. So then it all went horribly wrong. Uh, so there were a lot of reasons to stop being a games journalist or a journalist in the 2010s. So I mentioned Gamergate. Um, that definitely was a pushback against certain kinds of thinking, certain feminist <laughs> blogs that were also rising up during that time. In addition to the brainy sphere, there was this blog called the Border House blog that was excellent and many other uh, feminist blogs that were writing about games. But there were also a couple other heavy hitters that made it a lot harder for journalists to do their jobs. Uh, so I'm going to quote here, Northwestern University did a study in 2022 about newspaper loss. Uh, and Aaron Carter wrote it up and wrote, uh, since 2005, the country's lost more than one fourth of its newspapers and is on track to lose a third by 2025, end quote. And a lot of that was during the pandemic in particular. So between 2019 and 2022, uh, America saw an average of two newspapers a week closing, which is a lot of newspapers closing. And you might be wondering, you know, why is that? Well, a lot of times when there's a recession or when we're on uh, the brink of a recession, as we're being told right now, we supposedly are, uh, 
advertising budgets for companies are the first thing to go, which means that if you see layoffs, like recently we saw some layoffs um, at Spotify with their podcasts and advice and Fanbyte closed recently. Uh, the reason why those layoffs are happening now, right before a recession may happen, is because this is when advertising networks cut back. And because advertising had already changed in the move from print to online, it had already become less effective because, again, fewer people are looking at ads on the internet. Uh, that money just never came back. It was never replaced with anything. And now people are getting their news from Facebook and Google. They're not opening up a newspaper or going to a specific website and getting their news from, you know, polygon.com. People aren't really typing in that, those, those letters into the URL. They're instead Googling for the, the news they want. And then maybe they're clicking on Polygon from there, or maybe they're seeing it shared on Facebook or some other social media site. And that's tough because it means that every publication online has to fight with one another in order to be in those Google results and has very little control over what actually shows up there. So who cares, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I had this thought a lot, especially the past few years, especially during the pandemic, which I'll get onto on my next slide, which is games, they're just silly ephemeral toys, right? Like, does it really matter if there, if there aren't very many games journalists anymore? Does it really matter if there aren't very many journalists anymore? I would say it really matters to a level that is kind of scary. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna maybe scare you guys a little bit by giving some examples, but I'm also gonna hopefully open up your minds about why it matters so much. So the games industry is just a microcosm of the progress and also the backlash that has unfolded in so many other parts of culture. So Gamergate, that's August, 2014. What else happens in August, 2014? the Ferguson protests in Missouri, the Black Lives Matter movement becomes at the forefront of social media feeds, and Twitch starts growing in the 2010s as well, along with Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, and encourages activism and also radicalization. 8chan, people might be familiar with 8chan because it's been in the news recently. That's the website where the most extremist members of Gamergate used to hang out and go to after they got booted out of 4chan for being too extreme and it eventually became 8kun which was the home of QAnon and I was already deeply familiar with 8chan from my Gamergate days and I was the one who was having to explain it to my other reporter friends who were learning about QAnon so basically gamer culture it's a part of internet culture and internet culture is culture it's all part of the same mix so when I was writing about video games and even in my days when I was like oh why does it matter to write about video games it's never really just about video games. It's it's a part of everything else in our society. And maybe I think that way because I came up with the Boston Phoenix. I don't know. But to me, a critique of a game is also a critique of the world in which it was made. And that still really matters. So here's another reason it really, really matters. Uh, especially for you who are watching who are students. I, I really feel for you. And I, I'm not sure how inspirational I can be because I think if I had gone to school during a pandemic, I would be very skeptical. Uh, I definitely spent the pandemic thinking, do video games matter? And thinking a lot about the physical safety of me and my girlfriend and writing and e editing video game news felt pointless and silly. But the pandemic was also a period of time where more people than ever got back into video games. And we have some really good data on this, especially at Polygon in terms of just demographics changing, more women playing games, more different people of different ages playing games because they were stuck at home. And maybe they're people who had played games and given them up, but then went back to them again or got into them for the first time. And the other part of this that's important, this part is where I get a little scary, is that Art can influence people. Games can influence people. This isn't me saying, you know, Mortal Kombat is going to make people violent and it's the mid-2000s and I'm trying to ban violent video games. That's not where I'm going with this thought. The reality is way more complicated than that. And I'm going to use a few examples here. One is a game and the others are other forms of media in the way that media can change the way people think. And, and this will hopefully help you guys understand, help you all understand why I think journalism and writing about these issues is imperative. So let's talk about SimCity. So 
my colleague at Polygon, Clayton Ashley, he made a great video. Uh, you, you all can look it up after this if you want to learn more about it. So Will writes SimCity. He based it on a book called Urban Dynamics by J. Wright Forrester. And that book's theories led to the system design in the game. The black box, basically, that tells the game how a city should operate. But the problem is that Urban Dynamics isn't a neutral text because it, for example, argues in favor of slashing social programs and White House officials under Nixon were influenced by the book's policies. So here's a quote from Clayton. The book's model was also very abstract. None of the people in the city belonged to racial, ethnic, or gender categories, and it left out any representation of the city's geography, like neighborhoods or parks. When criticized by urban planners and anti-poverty activists, Forrester would protest that his model was merely a tool for understanding how cities worked. At the same time, he was happy to write articles for libertarian magazine Reason, using his computer-based analysis to broadly argue against social policies and their counterproductive effects. So once again, this is the book that Will Wright used to design SimCity, which is a game that is often credited for its realism. And it's been marketed in that exact way. And it's also actually influenced our real world. So Clayton did a lot of research for this video and found out that politicians played this game in various publicity stunts, basically to suggest they know how to run actual cities. And throughout all of that, the ideology of that original book is still a part of the black box that makes up this game. It's in the systems of SimCity itself. Forrester's perception of the world is in the book, and now that book is a game. Pretty creepy, right? So here's another example, not a video game, because this is not unique to video games. So we're gonna talk about police procedurals for a second. So the media around us, including games, also tries to depict systems from the real world, right? But it's not neutral because, you sensing a theme here? I don't believe objectivity is possible when human beings are making something. I just don't think we can do it. It's, it's tragic, really. Uh, so it's based on the, the worldview of the people telling the story. So take police and media. This started in the 50s. The LAPD consulted on the film Dragnet to ensure that it would be a heroic police story. And then we've had tons and tons of shows from Law and Order to Brooklyn Nine-Nine to all kinds of shows that are about the police. And Law and Order specifically works with police consultants. So Vulture did a story in 2020 that spoke to these consultants and producers and writers for true crime documentaries and also police procedurals. And um, here's one of the true crime doc producers. I'm quoting them. We have to get permission from the police because without them, we don't have a story. We're in the hero business. There have been times when I felt complicit in what is essentially a police department's PR campaign. I did once pitch a show about bad cops where we'd investigate crimes committed by police. That idea was just a complete non-starter. Chuckles around the table. And basically, these shows, even supposed true crime documentaries, are reflecting the world through the eyes of a cop. That's the black box in this scenario. Now, you may think that's fine, but it's still important to know what the black box is behind what you're watching. That's a perhaps gamified way of thinking about things, but systems can be similar to the way that a game is designed. It's a good way to think about everything. So, all right, here's another example. My personal favorite scary example, 24. Uh, this is a very old television show from a thousand years ago <laughs> in which a man named Jack Bauer interrogated people and tortured them. Uh, so we know from decades of scientific study that torture doesn't actually get results because people say anything just to get the pain to stop. But on 24, torture works over and over and over again. And uh, Joel Cerno, who's the co-creator and the pre producer, exec producer of 24, told The New Yorker in 2007, quote, the military loves our show. People in the administration love the series too. It's a patriotic show. They should love it, end quote. And uh, Democracy Now! reported in 2007 that higher-ups in the U.S. military actually approached 24's creative team and asked them to cut down on the torture because it was influencing real-life military interrogators. And one of the Army delegation members told Democracy Now!, quote, I did see interrogators copying some of the methods and the posture of not specifically 24, but certainly television programs, which increasingly have gotten more egregious with regard to torture. So here's a scene from Call of Duty where you have to torture somebody in order to progress in the game. And by the way, torture always works in this game. 
And uh, this is not a very graphic image because I didn't want to get too graphic here, but you are feeding glass to this man. So when I play Call of Duty and you have to torture somebody in order to progress, or any game where you have to torture somebody in order to progress, I think about this legacy and uh, how the systems are being reinforced here. Whose worldview is being reflected? What is the black box at the center of this? And that is always good. Always good to ask, which means, darn it, I guess journalism does matter after all. So this is a Hunter S. Thompson quote. Uh, <laughs> he's a cool guy. Um, RIP. He says, I can't think in terms of journalism without thinking in terms of political ends. Unless there's been a reaction, there's been no journalism. It's cause and effect. So because art can influence the world so much, not in a one-to-one -one Mortal Kombat makes you violent way, but a way bigger systematic way, we all have a really big responsibility to in what we choose to portray if we're making art and also identifying the systems at the center of that art if we're journalists, if we're critics. It is kind of terrifying to think about how big that responsibility is, but it's also exciting because it means that it's more imperative than ever for us to ensure that we have diverse perspectives represented in terms of who is looking at games and who's writing about them and everything else. We're mostly talking about video games today. So journalism does matter. And I guess it's kind of bad that it's dying. Uh, so we're going to talk about boys clubs a little bit. Um, in games and mainstream media, I, I when I came up, it was way more of a boys club. And that was really weird because it meant that I got extremely used to being in groups of entirely men. And I still am. There's still a part of me that is very used to that. But I'm so relieved that it's it's finally changing and it's only the beginning of it changing now and it has to keep going because that's the only way. Uh, the other thing that's happening slowly but surely is that mainstream journalism and games journalism don't have as much of a barrier between them as they once did. So there's more articles about video games in the Boston Globe and the New York Times, ma big mainstream publications now. They don't always get it right. I'm sure we're all familiar with the Twitter phenomenon of, of the NYT getting something wrong about a video game. And we all, we all enjoy talking about how they took pictures of a TV instead of taking screenshots of Elden Ring, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact that those articles even exist is, is quite different and notable. And to me, as somebody who used to work for a mainstream publication, it's a good thing, ultimately, that they're trying and having that divide between games only publications like the Kotaku's and Polygons of the world, of which I am a part, that divide, I think, is a bad thing because I learned so much from mainstream reporters and editors that I worked with. And that's a form of diversity that is 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 not really talked about in that way. But I do think that we have to break down that barrier between games journalism and the rest of mainstream media. And I'm glad to see it happening. I'm glad to see the Washington Post having a game section now. And I'm also glad to see just more and more people talking about the idea of games journalism being quote unquote, real journalism of any other kind. So the other issue here, blogs have kind of become crowdfunded journalism. So we see this a lot, Substacks, Patreons, I first started seeing that happen before Gamergate where people would uh, leave jobs and then form a Patreon because they couldn't find a, a games journalism job. And I, it was very controversial then and it's only continued now. Uh, the problem with relying on crowdfunding as a solution for, for these issues is you need to already be successful in order to have a successful crowdfund. And uh, when you have a Patreon, you don't have health insurance necessarily. You don't have the institutional support. For example, at Polygon, we have a legal team who can help us look over long-form investigations. Uh, you're competing directly with your peers as an individual rather than competing with other larger publications. And that's tricky because you yourself as an individual with a Patreon don't necessarily have a network of an editor or a producer or anyone else on your team, unless you're already successful. So the result is splitting people up 
uh, sort of turning everybody into the Samus Aran from my original manga slide where she's all alone in her, in her spaceship floating in space. And um, although it didn't feel that way to me at one time, I ultimately think we have to work together in order to fix something like this. So, I mean, how, how do we actually change it though? I mean, this is a, this is a tough one, but it's also kind of exciting as well, because I see so many things now that I never would have seen back then. I see more diverse people writing about games and making games, but also never would have expected long form YouTube videos to become one of the most popular ways to interface with games. That's become a form of criticism and journalism that is fascinating to me. I don't think the YouTube algorithm favors uh, five hour analyses of uh, Dark Souls, uh, but people are making it work. And, and sometimes they're doing it with Patreon and sometimes they're doing it in other ways. Uh, but there isn't a Boston Phoenix office to go and sit in and demand a job anymore. There isn't a place like that that you can physically go to. There's the internet and that is not exactly a place that <laughs> where money is made. And it, and it means then that a lot of people who get into games journalism are people who can afford to work an unpaid internship. They're, they're people like I was even back when there were more opportunities, people who didn't have student loans, who could afford to take an unpaid internship on top of the other job paying jobs that I had at the time. And that's just not everyone. And it's especially not everyone now. So where did all the money go and, and will it ever come back is a sentence I wrote in my notes. And uh, I, I don't have an answer, but heck, we got to figure it out. So open to ideas, <laughs> open to ideas in the Q and A. Uh, this is, this is my talk. You can find me at Mitty Myers on pretty much every social media platform that exists. Um, and you can listen to Triple Click in the Mutant Ages if you wish. You can find links to that at middymyers.com. But uh, let's, let's wrap. Let's talk about journalism. Uh, I will answer any and all questions. If, thank you, Maddie. That was great. Um, I know I have a lot of ideas. It probably Sean does too, but. Great. Um, we're going to fix it, guys. We're, we're fixing we may it not, today. <laughs> having a conversation is where you start, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, and we have a couple questions from colleagues, but um, and I know, I think a few people posted some questions or ideas in the chat. So if you have any ideas or thoughts uh, before uh, Sean and yeah. I try not to take over, um, <laughs> please either raise your hand or, or post it uh, a comment in the chat. Um, I can go back uh, up and uh, yeah. answer some of the questions that are in the sure, chat we had, and are old. Yeah, I think um, both Joan and Eli Cazares had questions. Um, mm -hmm. Joan's so was about, uh, I think it started with the, the focus on talking about tech aspects. I'm not exactly sure, Joan, if you're still here um where you were what the context for that question was i think it was um, about uh the initial differences between reviewing a game okay. as a piece of software versus reviewing a game as a piece of art which is a tension that i would say led to gamergate pretty directly like the mm -hmm. idea that there's an objective way to review a piece of software but a subjective way to review a piece of art and also that it's feminine to be subjective and that women don't play games and therefore shouldn't be listened to. Uh, all of that was layered in there. And for me, um, there, there was still, you know, does the game work or not? That was still a key point of concern if I was writing about games for the Phoenix, but I also was really focused on writing about games for a mainstream audience early in my career. And also when I pitched stories about games, I was pitching them to editors who didn't play games and I had to make them seem interesting. Mm -hmm. So I was finding the story, I was often with a human angle, like a human interest angle or a cultural angle or sociopolitical angle because that's the environment I was in. But I think it was also just a good form of practice for thinking about games as art in addition to pieces of software. So I, I do, you know, I, I'm certainly familiar enough that I could only talk about the technical aspects of games, but 
I never had to. And I appreciated that. Okay. And then she was asking also about Warner Brothers and yeah. the most recent takedown, I think, of a lot of their animation um, from the HBO streaming services, I think is where that question was going, maybe. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is sort of adjacent to my yeah. field, uh, but Polygon covers a lot of how the entertainment industry has changed in the age of the internet and streaming, moving away from older forms of income, which definitely seems similar to me to the move from print to online for newspapers, uh, like not relying on Nielsen ratings anymore in terms of how many people actually watched an HBO show, and then also figuring out how to make those shows profitable. It's a huge problem. I mean, I, I think we're going to continue to see mm -hmm. companies trying to and possibly failing to figure that out in the age of streaming. Uh, and it, we're already seeing it happen with uh, Warner Brothers and Cartoon Network currently and figuring out what the future is going to be there. Yeah. And then a question from Eli. And if you're still here, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask it yourself if you'd like, or I'm happy to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For my question is often whenever I hear of games journalism, they often get like a bad reputation because when it comes to like reviewing games, they often like it seems like when you look at their gameplay, it feels like they don't know how to play the game at all. Like um, I mentioned the example of the cut type gameplay from from a guy named Dean Takahashi. What is your take yeah. on it? Uh, well, what's the question? I are you asking me if I know how to play games? Because I don't. No. <laughs> and I'm glad it's coming out now. Um, well, but no, for real. Like, do you? What's What's your question? Um, my curiosity is that is that if if they don't if often journalists don't know how to play games, then why do they join in this game journalism? That if they if they struggle to play a simple game, it's like a, it's not like a. I'm just um. Well, I don't know that all journalists do struggle to play games. Mm -hmm. I think that that is something that people say if they don't like somebody very much. <laughs> <laughs> I've certainly had that levied at me. Um, but I also know that that stream of Dean Takahashi went viral at the time and he got a lot of flack for it. And uh, I think probably message received in his case. Uh, there aren't very many other Famous examples of that though. I honestly, I work with a lot of people who are incredibly good at video games, especially our guides team whose guides I use constantly. So I guess I would <laughs> counterpoint that if you've ever read a video game guide, those people are also journalists. They're also taking notes as they play. They're also uh, working with everybody else on the team. They're getting edited and copy edited and fact checked the same way everyone else is. And they are some of the best people ever at games because they have to be and a lot of times they're playing a game before it's even out and they're having to figure it out all by themselves mm -hmm. so yeah i actually think mostly people get into games journalism because they like games and maybe they're not an expert maybe they're not a pro esports pro but they probably like games at the very least and that's enough i think okay um thank you um thank you <laughs> There's another question here. A follow up on that too, Maddie. Like, um, I don't think Sean and I are very good at games, but uh, a part of it is, is, and maybe this is what he was getting at too, is, you know, how you read the game, how you think about the game, how it's culturally situated, which, for me, is is a, as you talked to, is a very important part of that. Um, the game itself like I am not just interacting with it as a game I'm interacting with it as a cultural and often historical oh, object yeah. where I want to mm -hmm. see the value of its representation and as you I think um, so adroitly mentioned its impact that it can have in mm -hmm. kind of a multiplicity of ways that we don't necessarily think about um, because you know when you read these as media forms and we read media as, as having a large uh, impact on society. These are important objects in that sense that have that very tactile and direct, if not direct, at least indirect effect about how people think about the world around them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And But Jared here has a question. <laughs> I'll just read it out. Unless Jared, you want to ask it. Yeah, I'll ask it. 
Hi. Um, when narrowing down stories to cover uh, theft in the video game space, what is the first step to find like sources or leads? Do you tend to like reach out to the company directly for statements, or do you kind of root around the, the sphere online to see what they were saying? So it depends on the story. Uh, so a lot of video game companies are very opaque in terms of how games are made and the PR is very strict compared to say movie PR. Uh, for example, you, you might be able to get some pretty spicy quotes from a movie director ahead of their premiere even, but it's very difficult to get something like that from game directors. And that's just a tradition going back a pretty long time in terms of just the way that PR controls messaging really effectively in games. Uh, so if I were doing a reported story about something that is more controversial, for example, like workplace issues, then I wouldn't necessarily go to the company first. I would probably have heard about that from someone who worked at the company or seen a post about it on social media from somebody who alleged that they worked at the company. And I would reach out to them first and try to obtain proof that they did work there and also talk to them about their experience before then circling back to the company and asking them for comment on that situation. If I were to do it the other way around, going to the company first, uh, I probably wouldn't get anywhere and the company might try to find that employee and shut it down ahead of time, which is uh, a concern anyway, and something that you have to be aware of if you're going back to a, a company and asking them about uh, a story that someone has told you. You need to decide if you're going to make them anonymous or not and the extent to which that's possible. But if it's a story that is more about the making of a game and it's something that the company might actually speak to, then you could go to the company first. Although again, uh, it depends how big the company is. Like uh, for AAA games, it can be pretty difficult to get interviews where people actually are forthright with you about their decision-making in designing a game. Uh, but with indie developers, it's, it's easier because the stakes are lower and they are excited to promote their game. So they're more likely to be vulnerable and actually admit, for example, if there was any type of creative tension or problem in the making of the game, anything that might make for an interesting story, for example, uh, you're not likely to get it from a AAA studio, but you might get it from a AA studio or a single A indie studio because they're not as blanketed by PR. Like just as an example, um, Nicole Carpenter at Polygon, one of our reporters, recently did a story about Disney, the Disney game Dreamlight Valley about how they designed the character Scar because he's a lion and a lot of characters in that game are Disney characters who are humans. And that was a challenge for them, designing Scar. And she was telling me <laughs> about how, I, I believe she said there were four PR people in addition to the people she was actually interviewing who were just also on the Zoom call which even for a pretty low stakes conversation about like designing Scar from the Lion King and Disney's Dreamlight Valley, there were, there were multiple PR people there um, who I'm sure prepped the interviewees ahead of time. And then also were just sitting there to make sure that nothing untoward was said. And uh, that can really have a chilling effect on interviews and it can result in some pretty boring quotes, frankly. So it's, it's a real challenge. Um, and it's something that I really missed about in-person events and like the loss of stuff like E3 post pandemic is that, it's it's easier to get really good interviews with people if you can actually talk to them extemporaneously rather than in these extremely mediated spaces that are really tightly controlled and where the PR person can just interrupt at any time and be like, that's enough for today and end the Zoom call. Uh, it's tough. That, that reminds me slightly of, we had Janaman Norhagen come speak and he's really great. And, yeah, he's great. Uh, but, you know, he was so frank, right? It was just... <laughs> Here it is. It's me uh -huh. and it sucks. So you need to know that. And, <laughs> but you really get, you get that sense with, you know, the, the, the scale of the developer or the, the company right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially since he has the experience of having worked for a larger company a big, and then going yeah. indie. So he's really seen all the facets of it. And mm -hmm. now as an indie has the, the ability to just be frank about how difficult <laughs> the job really is. <laughs> yes. 
um and 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 i mean really self-effacing when it came to to his own work and and how he approached it it was it was really I, when we had him it was really eye-opening to hear an indie developer just kind of like just spill everything he just like nope this is really hard it, when we asked him about his research methods he's like well it's me so um, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> i got books out of the library um, and um yeah so um it looks like luis t also has a question do you want to jump on and ask or we can read it out for you give you that opportunity luis sure i can ask um sure. in person um so Polygon is a website that does articles about all sorts of media, not just video games, which is awesome. I'm curious, mm -hmm. um, Maddie, if you've seen any difference in how people respond to articles, especially like the, the really interesting, uh, more controversial articles about that um, talk about sexism and such. If there's any difference in how people respond, depending on whether it's about a video game or a movie or a TV show. Thank you. I think that it's not that different because I'm always hesitant to sort of group things together as quote unquote nerd culture, because what even is that? And that could have been its own entire talk, I suppose, us attempting to define that. But it is also nominally Polygon's editorial purview, whatever those words mean. Uh, so we do cover movies and TV and comic books and books, but a lot of times we're covering sci-fi and fantasy, genre fiction, uh, the kinds of things that one could become a huge nerd about. Uh, and unfortunately or fortunately, uh, nerd culture has often been marketed as and presented as a straight white male pursuit. And it's only recently that that's really changed. Um, there's a really good article that um, I can I tweeted recently. It's old. Tracy Lane wrote it for mm -hmm. Polygon. And it's about video games primarily, but it's it's relevant to this, which is it's called No Girls Allowed. And it's about how in the 90s, marketing of video games really changed to be geared almost exclusively towards young boys, as opposed to just being for everyone. Like we can kind of remember, especially if you like go back and play the original Monkey Island games or Myst or old games where there were female characters in the game and that wasn't a big deal at all. And then in the 90s, things really changed. Yeah, Sean included, mm -hmm. thanks. That's a link yep. to this <laughs> wonderful story. Um, and that's happened across a lot of other sort of quote unquote nerd properties like comic books and and therefore the superhero movies that are based on them uh a lot of that the power fantasy is is depicting a certain kind of white man more often than not even though many of those superhero comics and you know star trek i mean we all know that those original writers and creators had progressive values and were attempting mm -hmm. to communicate that through allegory but somehow despite that the messages that were taken away were just this idea of a sort of revenge of the nerds, white male power fantasy. And that is still an issue for anybody who writes about, you know, the black characters in the Lord of the Rings Amazon show or House of the Dragon or diversity in Marvel movies and Star Wars and all the other things we cover. And that's definitely an issue in terms of how people cover that stuff and the scrutiny that they face. And I think it's really, it's something that makes it really hard to be a journalist as well, mm -hmm. in addition to the other challenges that we've already noted. I mean, it's hard to be an actor or make games and have that be the response when you're trying to reflect your own life experience. But then also if you're writing about something and you're criticizing it, or you're celebrating it for, for having certain perspectives in it, uh, it's really, it has a chilling effect to be faced with bigotry in response to that. And it does make people not want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's really sad. Again, it's something that I don't have a great solution to because uh, I'm just a person who responds to conflict by saying, well, I'll show you, <laughs> but not everyone is like that. And I think that even people who don't have that personality trait still have really valuable perspectives and should still feel like they can have their voices be heard. So yeah, I, I think maybe if you're writing about certain movies, I don't know, it's pretty bad all around, honestly. If you're writing about sexism, you're gonna get probably a bad response <laughs> still <laughs> somehow. No, that's that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a plug real quick for okay. 
for people that are here, but uh, Sean and I teach a couple of classes on both the computing uh, technology that deals with a lot of these issues, um, the history of sort of that sexism and where that comes from and how it developed into a sort of masculinized identity and culture. And then we also teach a class 306 that is um, looks at representation in games purposefully and also what comes out of that gamer gate mm -hmm. and things like this. So if anyone's here is interested in, in learning more deeply about these things in terms of video games, principally, um, a plug for our classes, History yeah. 306 and 307. <laughs> yes. Um, and I mean, and to me, kind of jumping on to this, this notion of how do we, how do we fix things? How do we make, um, you know, games journalism and games criticism um, maybe more, uh, we fix it, I guess, in, in a way. It's conversations like this too, right? Where we're not only are we in some ways kind of, hoping to bring game studies into a broader humanities kind of context, but also mainstreaming um, another set of voices in these in these conversations, right? Whether um, it's a gendered conversation or whether it's an academic conversation, it's, it's about thinking about games in a way that is as as you said earlier, right, as cultural objects. Um, for us, they're historical objects. For a critic, they're they're a cultural object or a piece of art. Um, and to recognize that there is subjectivity and 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 bias in all interpretation, right? Um, it's one of the core um, tenets of our history curriculum here, right, is that history is an interpretation. Anything that we're deconstructing is an interpretation, and it's always rooted in those personal relationships with whatever that object is. Um, and, you know, if I'm getting my politics in your video games, then, you know, you should either just back away from reading what I have to say, or um, let's have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. right. It doesn't always work quite that way. No, I know. I'm, I'm... I think it has. I mean, it's, it's weird, because I've been doing it for long enough that I have really seen how it's changed, and how different it was when I started and how the idea of writing about games in that way was seen as really strange like not even just that people would react with bigotry but they would just be like what are you talking about mm. like why would you even analyze a video game in that way uh and that's really really changed and some of that is because mm. games have changed they get they've gotten more complicated mm. but also they're easier for more and different kinds of people to make there are many more tools that allow more people to make games now than there were 20 years ago and it's easier to share them. I mean, all the things that have crushed <laughs> the media industry, all the things about the internet that have crushed institutional media are also the the other half of that is, is that they're also the things that make it possible for anyone to make a mm. game and share it. It just might not necessarily actually be found because you'll be yeah. lost in the algorithm C. <laughs> but it is also weirdly a good thing that, that has changed so much and that in theory, anyone can make a YouTube video with long form criticism of a game and anyone can make a Tumblr with their own thoughts or whatever. Yeah. Anybody can write a twine game if they want exactly. and put it on yeah. right? and put it for Point. free on or make HIO an RPG or maker yeah. game or other or use yeah. unity or any number of other <laughs> ways to make simple games if only i could use unity um, <laughs> <laughs> on that, on that, there's a question from a colleague who couldn't attend and i'm just going to ask it and it, maybe sure. it works here <laughs> they said uh to what extent um do you think maddie that gaming has the potential to be transformative in a positive way for human interactions it's a big question uh they continue <laughs> there are all sorts of a spectra that you can map out individual players in terms of how uh, they commodify or they choose their roles. Um, example, from ogre characters who playfully chat in ogre speak to alphas who shirtless, muscled, and eye-patched characters try to grab all the good loot. <laughs> yeah, I, 
<laughs> I don't know that I think, I feel like this question is edging towards an assumption that I see a lot of people make with games in an excited way, which is like, oh, games combine so many different art forms. And that's why they're the best art form. Cause it's like a movie, but also you're interacting with it. It's got music, it's got acting, it's got poetry. It's got every kind of art. You can just shove it all in there. And like, yeah, that is true. Uh, in a literal description of what a game can be and do. It can have all these different elements, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's more powerful than a movie or a book, I don't think. Uh, it, it instead means that it has unique challenges and it has to rise to more occasions by having music that is intermarried with dialogue and systems and whatever else is a part of this, this hypothetical game we're imagining. And that means it's really hard for games to stick the landing, but it's also so cool and impressive when they do. And I still, I don't think they're the best. I don't think they're the best art form, but part of why I am still so fascinated by them, because again, I did, I did write about theater a lot for the Phoenix way back when I was really into theater, which I feel like there's a lot of overlap in terms of like criticizing a play and like the staging of something and, and also a, a virtual experience. I feel like I learned from both halves of that type of art criticism when I was starting out. Um, I, I just feel like writing about games is more exciting because when I started, they're just what wasn't really that much really good criticism of games. So I felt like I was filling a void, but also games are just still really fascinating to me. They're doing things that other art forms can't. And I don't think that makes them superior, but it does mean that mm -hmm. they are different and cool. And they're also a really young art form, which is exciting because it's like, you know, remember when movies were starting out and everybody just thought they were silly and then they became respected as they are today. Uh, and now video games are always trying to steal movies stees <laughs> and have their own Oscars. Uh, um, it's just, I don't know, it's, a, it's an exciting time, but that does mean that it's also a time of tension and mm -hmm. growing pains and people trying to figure out what can make a game really special and exciting. And I, I think that's part of what your colleague is asking is like, can a game really change a mind or whatever. I mean, I don't think it can any more than a book or anything else, but mm -hmm. it is really exciting to imagine what a game could do. Yeah, I, and, and maybe that is what they're getting at. And I think the idea of them being a new media form um, presents these new questions because you have to, you do have to look at them very differently than, than a book or a film or, and, um, but that does give them a sort of power to do the unexpected, unexpected if they they are done well. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but I guess in that genre vein, it's they're like films. Like there's a hundred bad movies for every good film, yeah. right? And and, yeah. and or they're just that. I think what's tricky, um, or can be perceived as tricky, is, is you know there's always the tension and maybe this is what you experienced and I know Sean and I experienced in our in our own discipline you know historians that are doing cultural readings of video games is is kind of not the norm, <laughs> the norm. yeah um in, in in some other disciplines it, it's seen as the norm or, or no more norm all oops I think we lost Jeff maybe reading them does take a, a particular set of of a, a particular set of lens to to look at them and understand them mm -hmm. um, beyond just being able to play them but reading them within their cultural milieu um, to get that and I and 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 you know it, it's kind of like people would view films as entertainment and games are entertainment and we can watch them and just be entertained and that's something but they they're just like films but they're more than that they're they're beyond just something that you hmm. well you consume them and, and in consuming them they become part of you in some way that's impactful i think um and and um i think because they're so pervasive um and and people kind of just uh can throw them off as just being entertainment they lose sight of of the power for good, bad, neutral that that they can have um, 
just overall, like I think your example of using the torture example was really uh, powerful. Um, I must say, I hated that show. Um, 24, yes. <laughs> because of what it was. I, it just, it's, it's spoke to me in all the wrong ways. And I found it, I'll just, I, I found it disturbing that it was such, it was seen as such like a, a good program to be watching. Um, it mm-hmm. was like watching Jack Webb's Dragnet in the 1950s, which, which yeah. really was just the LAPD driving up down the street telling everybody <laughs> police are good, right? When you have a, a racist police department. Mm-hmm. Um, and so having that context and, and melding those things together are really, for me, what's really powerful about understanding these mediums and what they can do. Um, like even before we got on, I, I was just quickly doing a rerun of Bury Me, My Love. And it's such a simple game. And yet the, the power behind it to tell a story um, about love, loss, destruction, war, all these things are, um, I don't know, they're, they, they can do a lot if, if, if they can do a lot, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i under embargo, but I'm playing Band of the Three right now. And I just recently replayed one and two. And I it has me, it has had me thinking a lot about female characters in games and how much that conversation's changed. And mm-hmm. one of the things you said that reminded me of that was how at the time when those first two games came out, a lot of people were talking about like the idea of the male gaze, which is a film term. And the reason why that term works so well for film is because it is the gaze of the filmmaker and that lens is pointed at very specific things and it is a premeditated gaze. It is designed to only look at what is in that rectangle. Whereas a game is not that way. Like there are cutscenes where the the camera is controlled and you are getting potentially a male gaze or, or some other form of gaze, but you are also getting control of the camera Mm. a lot of the time yourself and also you are controlling the character and when I was playing those first two games at the time I was like this is an example of how a game about a woman who has I like she has a sex drive that is what the games are about she's a very sexual character and that was very controversial at the time because it, it she's sexualized she's objectified arguably by the camera at various points but also she is empowered at various points. And that is that tension between those two things really confuses people. And I think it's because it's a game, because you are playing as mm-hmm. this character, you are inherently going to be empowered because you are her. You have the power to do everything that she does. That's you. And that is always going to be different in my view from a film mm-hmm. or a book or a, or a piece of music even where there's it's not ever objective. I think we can all at least agree on that, but the interactivity there is that you're perceiving it but with a game you're at least in part controlling it or perhaps inhabiting some piece of it and that will change the way that you interpret it Mm. and means that we have to come up with new terms i mean i i don't know that male gaze is quite it and i sort of thought that at the time and i still think that um but there is something to it it's it's inviting a new form of criticism that i think is still really exciting Mm. Yeah, I think player agency really is the key difference in this media, right? It's the only, it's, it allows us to subvert narrative if we want to. It allows us to make the, the. I mean, I understand that the narrative is point A to point B at some level and we have to, we have to, right? Um, Jeff and I have argued about this and have proposed well, it depends various. depends on the game too. Right? So it's yeah. hard to even make a generalization, but right. yeah, and, go on. Well, we've, we've we've proposed a paper called "Divorcing Dutch" because Jeff, when he plays um, Red Dead, will just skip all of the story um, so that he can it, it, you know go through the immersive environment that is the world. Um, and I'm more, much more of a I'm going to play the damn narrative and get through it. But I also hate the idea that I have to, and I guess spoilers for an older game, but um, that I have to engage in the violence that like Micah wants you to engage in while you're playing the game because I'm I'm playing as a much more kind of pacifistic cowboy um if that's if right (laughs) um yeah and 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 the game will break my my relationship with it when it forces me like like those torture scenes when it forces you to do something that you don't necessarily want to do um Mm -hmm. but I mean anyway 
Um, and and I think that that's what makes the this so so unique. And in some ways, it gives us right as as consumers of these medias, um, it gives us a much more personal voice in the way that we're experiencing them. And that then in the way that we criticize or write about these games, it makes it even that much more personal. It's hard, right? It's hard to divorce that person. Nobody's ever told me that I don't know how to watch TV, right? <laughs> but I've been told I don't know how to play a video game. Sean, you don't um, know how to watch right? TV. Thanks, <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> right. Um, or that I'm I'm watching TV wrong. You're not um, even looking at this. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I feel like if you get really in the weeds and you talk to some TV critics, you might get accused of that. There's certainly okay. like there is some of that, but I but I agree with you that it's not it's not as common of a, right. a factor in terms of how people talk about it. Like there is mm. the idea of can you beat this or not that mm -hmm. has made games a very frustrating and interesting object to write about. Well, it's it's the yeah. power of like you both suggested. Once you inhabit the character, often, right? Um, what do you, what do you do with it? And now there, there's two things going on there. One, the rails of the character. You have to do certain things to mm -hmm. move the narrative along. Um, and then two, to what extent do you become the character because you feel associated with, or does it draw you in to that sort of itness of whatever that character is? Like mm -hmm. uh, if we take, you know, I'll just go with the Red Dead, you know, Morgan, um, you know, he's a, he's a, he's really a gangster, right? He's, he's a conflicted gangster. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, Cowboys as Gangsters is like, um, about as mythical as you can get, but it, it 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 teaches the kind of narrative that that's what cowboys were, which it's really the inflicted moralist the cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but you can only be as complicated as the game lets you. allows you. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that can also be really powerful. Yeah. I, I feel like there's something to be said for a game where you don't have a lot of choice, but you're instead just getting to inhabit a really well-realized character and seeing what choices they see as the only options and, mm -hmm. and imagining if you were someone who had those as what you saw as your only options. And that can be really powerful in a way that other forms of media can't be oh, yeah. because mm -hmm. it's a different way of proposing what a human is like. I mean, we're all just trying to I, I think everybody should listen one another, to you know, <laughs> the triple click on papers, please. You just yeah. did, because mm -hmm. I mean, that's a good example, right? Where you yes. talk about that character who you must make those difficult moral choices um, about what to do with people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you inhabit that. And I mean, unless you're the cruelest person around, I mean, you're going to be thinking about those things, no matter which direction you take. You've, the, the idea is planted in there by the game because of who you control and, and you can't separate and you shouldn't separate that. And I think I think that um, that's a really good. Um, there's a lot of good examples, but that's a, a good example of that, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Looking for any last questions before we thank Maddie for her time. We've kept her for quite a while here. Um, I saw a quick mention. Looks like, uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Dr. Reed, uh, Thomas Reed wrote, absolutely loving this conversation. I'm currently working on a project on Native American representations as a Native person. Uh, thank you all for your knowledge and insight. So just a really kind comment there so thank you um maddie is the famous samus of all of them so uh, <laughs> or the, her their favorite samus of uh, oh oh uh, that's really hard um <laughs> i do like the original samus <laughs> justin bailey outfit as it's called the leotard it's a good one <laughs> that one's that one's a deep cut yeah. <laughs> that one's for the olds in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and